Excellent. Welcome, everyone. For those who are joining for the first time, the Text and Transmission Joint Research Seminar was set up to put together in one room projects on various, various manuscript tradition, language spaces, and historical contexts, hopefully conducive to a bit of uh, methodological contamination across fields that are not obviously or always in contact with one another. To briefly introduce um, your Tetra hosts today, our distinguished speaker will be presented by Georgia Nicosia, who is a PhD candidate at Ghent University and a PhD in Paris, working on collections of Syriac historiographical excerpts. Later on, the Q&A session will be chaired by Valentina Duca, postdoctoral fellow at Keo Leuven, working on Syriac ascetic mystical literature. And the other two organizers of the Tetra Research Seminar are then Andy Hilkens, um, postdoctoral fellow at Ghent University, who works on Syriac Armenian interfaith dialogue, and myself, Dan Batovic, postdoc at Keo Leuven, working on ancient translations of early Christian literature. And with this, I'm happy to invite my colleague, Georgia Nicosia, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody who joined. And thank you, of course, to Professor Francis Gatshednet for being here. It is my great honor today to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Francis Gatshednet, who is a research director, director at the CNRS, a member of the Académie de Suscription et de Belles and president and co founder of the Societe de Syriac. Summarizing Professor Francis Gatshednet's merit and achievement is not an easy task. She's an alumna of the Ecole Normale Supérieure de jean Fier, and she obtained her PhD from the Université Paris 1 with a thesis on the relationship between Phoenician cities and the Kingdom of Israel and Judah. Her thesis was awarded with the prize Fondation Pierre. Already after her graduation in history, she was appointed as a pensionnaire at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and charged with cataloging Syriac manuscripts. Today, speaks thanks to this experience, not only did she develop great critical skills, but she also deepened her knowledge of Syriac sources after having studied Hebrew, Phoenician, Aramaic, Akkadian, Middle Persian, Gaze, and Arabic, and many other languages. Afterwards, in the 90s, she obtained her habilitation à dirigeur de recherche at the Université François Rabelais de Tours, and today she is the director de recherche at the CNRS. Her areas of expertise are multiple and wide ranging, covering the history of the Middle East during the first millennium, Syriac and West Semitic epigraphy and cosmology, culture and texts of Middle Eastern Christianity, Greek culture during Hellenistic and Roman age, historical study of the Hebrew, and of the Hebrew Bible and others. What characterizes her work in these domains beside her admirable expertise and acumen is a fundamentally historical approach in studying either the Bible or Syriac culture, she always paid attention to material culture within objects and materiality of texts themselves, be they manuscript or inscription, thus contributing to setting a new course in these domains. At the same time, she pushed forward both the study of Syriac scripts in manuscript and in inscription, and of manuscripts in a wider sense. In her catalogs, in fact, she valued as well the materiality of the books and the text of colophons, achieving thus what could be defined as an archaeology of books. Professor Francois Bicol Chatonnet is also the merit of having been able to create a network of trust and good collaboration with institution and library in Europe, India, Lebanon, and so forth, promoting thus the diffusion and digitization of descriptions and manuscripts. Moreover, her works chart uh, the political, religious, and linguistic history of the Near East, based also on elements emerging from archaeology and topography. From what I said so far, I think it's easy to deduce that her bibliography is too rich to be recalled in brief here. Uh, if you want to read a list of her publication on the Syriac words, together with a much better presented biography, I would refer to you to the first thrift, Le Calamele Sisu, that was uh, written in an honor and presented to her last November. But allow me to mention just a few, only a few of her books. I already alluded to some of the catalogs she co-edited, amongst which uh, the one of St. Ephraim Ecumenical Research Institute of Kataya in India, and of the Catholic, Syriac Catholic Patriarchate of Chafe in Lebanon. As to her epigraphical works, I would like to mention the creation, together with Alain Desmond, of the Requel de Description Syriac, 
and of the ERS project in Syria. Furthermore, the book uh, Le Monde Syriac, written together with Muriel Debye, was awarded two prizes in 2018, Les Grand Prix du Livre d'Histoire du Monde Arabe et Les Prix de la Dame à la Licor. Amongst other prizes, François de Péchetonnet was awarded the Médaille de Bronze of the CNRS in 1993, and in 2006, the Irangile Curie de la Femme Scientifique. Already Chevalier de l'Ordre du Mérite, Professor François Vieux Cachetonnet was elected in 2021 as member of the Académie des Inscriptions de Belles Lettres, a recognition that marked again the remarkability of her career. Today, Professor François Vieux Cachetonnet will present a lecture entitled Multilinguism and Multiculturalism in Northern Syria between Aramaic and Greek from the beginning of our era to late antiquity, as seen from epigraphy. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Georgia. It was very much, uh, well, it's too much things done. Yeah, and you show that I go in every direction <laughs> without <laughs> any fixed subject. Anyway, uh, it will be mainly about epigraphy that I will uh, speak uh, today because I'm, I've been very much interested also in uh, materiality and in. Uh, Syriac inscriptions too. So uh, in our world now, I think uh, we, we live in a very clearly multicultural cultural, uh, world. And uh, it has done given some uh, topicality to the issue of languages in contact, uh, to bilingualism and multilingualism. Uh, you will be very, uh, easily shows that I'm not very fluent in uh, speaking English, but anyway. Uh, the idea of uh, coexistence of several languages in the same state, in the same place, uh, in the same political community uh, is, well, something very much present now uh, and very important as it involves issues as education, administration, public display, and many others. This question which uh, we are in now is not at all new in the Near East uh, because uh, multiple languages have always coexisted in antiquity uh, and there have often be, been a distortion, a sort of mismatch between spoken and written language. Uh, for example, if we think of the Levant, uh, for a long time, people were, would write in Babylonian, Aram Akkadian, and speak West Semitic languages. So, the, and they were fluent with both, uh, both uh, systems. And even in uh, non-phonetic writing systems, one cannot be sure the language that was written. I mean, when you have an ideogram, a sumerogram, you don't know if it was in fact written in Sumerian, in Akkadian, in Hittite, in Ugaritic, and so on. So uh, this multiplicity has always been um, very much uh, well present in the, in the Near East. The language of political power, the language spoken by the elites, and the language of culture could be different not to mention for, uh, uh, for sure the popular language. So in North Syria, Aramaic is attested as a written language since the ninth century BC by inscriptions that can roughly be dated uh, through uh, links with the Bible and uh, also with uh, Assyrian sources. The language has developed into an international language and has spread from Southern Egypt to Sogdiana, I mean, at present the, the Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, and from Arabia to Northern Anatolia. It was therefore a language with a very strong position that Greek meets from the time of the Macedonian conquest. Aramaic was very firmly installed. Uh, however, this position of strength is hardly visible in the core uh, 
the original region of the Remek conquest, even of, at the Achaemenid period. And here, perhaps, I can begin with my uh, PowerPoint if you give me the floor. It's okay. So, Uh, here, is it okay? You can see. Uh, okay. Uh, so, in uh, the core of uh, Aramaic region, the original uh, region, which is more or less this. Or it would be more or less this, but we'll speak about that. Uh, it will be the core of what we speak to, uh, together today. The uh, north of the uh, Fertile Crescent, in the Achaemenid period, uh, the display of writing is rare here. I mean, we have a lot of Aramaic inscriptions from Achaemenid period, from Egypt, from Anatolia and more and more from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Uzbekistan and Arabia, Arabia, of course, but very, very few from the original region of the Arameans. Uh, it's do so more in uh, peripheral, peripheral regions that the evidence is abundant because the Delhi uh, script is more preserved here in Egypt and uh, in Central Asia, it preserves more documents on wood, on papyrus and so on. But uh, some documents such as uh, seals and uh, coins, testimony of this use. And I, uh, for example, here is a document of the very end of the economic period, uh, a coin from the satrap must die and uh, a seal also is scripted in uh, Aramaic. So it testifies that it was well written in this region. And must, uh, the coin by must die is many, uh, probably from the region of Hierapolis, Membich. Alexander's conquest created completely new conditions by imposing Greek as a language of power, elites, and culture. So grouping the three uh, fundamental uh, uses, uh, power, elites, and culture. Before uh, well, to see the relation between Greek and Aramaic from this period, and before going to Aramaic, I would like to show you from the Hellenistic period a small document. Well, it's not Aramaic, but uh, Phoenician, but it shows this uh, shift, I mean, from uh, Semitic to, uh, to Greek. This is a graffito from Wasta in Lebanon, the grotto of Wasta, and it's a cave near Tyre. It's written in Greek characters, but in Phoenician language. So you have the text in Greek. Uh, as far as I know, it's not no more, uh, available, but it was copied here. It's in Renan, Mission du Phénicie. And uh, um, the, the Phoenician uh, text, so that, uh, such as we can uh, reconstruct it, from the uh, transcription in Greek. It attests to a desire to maintain uh, the use of Phoenician at a time when it was no longer really mastered. A situation therefore different from Aramaic, but we witness to complex relations between the local language and Greek. Aramaic in Syria, thus more or less disappeared from the written sphere after the, Arabic con the Alexander conquest. The known Aramaic inscriptions from this period are from Armenia, Iran, India, or Palestine, and there particularly 
in Jewish circles. The relief of the priest Philotas is one of the very few exceptions because of its bilingual character. So it's written here uh, in Aramaic, Greek, and text Greek here. Uh, it could be dated from the end of the third century before Christ or beginning of the second. Its exact origin is not known, well, it appeared on the antiquity market, of course, uh, but uh, one can think because of the use of basalt of a mason, but it most probably comes from the north between Hierapolis and Samosat. So, the region we are studying. It should be noted that the bilingual part is only in uh, the identification of the character. So here, the per uh, person, Philotas Hierus, Philotas is reconstructed from here, and here in uh, Aramaic, and the dedication is only in Greek. The offering thus don't, uh, is only in Greek. Philotas, son of Philo, had the monument that represents the god erected and made the monument to present himself. That's the translation. And in the Aramaic only, it, Philotas is named with the priest. Another example that can be brought forward is the Aramaic inscription of Yanur in the interland of Biblos in Lebanon found in a wall in 1960 and unfortunately lost uh, since the war. It was uh, inserted in a wall, it was uh, taken away and uh, with uh, what became antiquities during the war, it disappeared. So we have only uh, this uh, picture from the time of discovery. The dating, so you have yeah, the transcription, is uh, most probably related to uh, Seleucid era, which would al allow it to be dated to 110, 109 BC. Uh, I, have, uh, I was studying with Pierre Bordrai. We proposed to link it, link it to the Iturian principality that are developed in the Beka, and of which we have some epitaphs, epigraphs and coins. This would explain the presence of Aramaic in Lebanon, in the Lebanon mountain at this early date. Uh, if the writing uh, is uh, difficult to identify and presents parallels with uh, the South Aramaic, I absolutely do not follow uh, Gabi Abu Samra, who sees in it an Abatean inscription. I mean, it's possible graphically, but totally improbable historically. So the link with Iturians, from whom we know a little of the script through coins, is the, the best solution, I think. Anyway, these two inscriptions from so the Seleucid uh, era are only exceptions. It's a part of a landscape where Aramaic seems to have disappeared in Syria, at least at a written language uh, in front of Greek. In fact, Greek was so, not so much uh, written in, uh, in the Seleucid era, we have in fact very few inscriptions also. The resurgence of written Aramaic from the end of the Seleucid period in Palmyra, Nabaten, Edessa, elsewhere, and uh, also uh, east uh, in Hatra and the whole uh, Mesopotamia, testifies to the persistence of the oral use of this language and probably also of its written use. I mean, if it's uh, still, it can be written at the beginning of Roman era, it means that it, it had been used uh, in between, even, even if we have almost no testimony. But so from the beginning of the Roman uh, period, 
we have a sort of resurgence of Aramaic in front of Greek. And it's uh, the question of the relations between the two that I want to explore uh, today. And first in Edessa, one of the places where this resurgence is attested is Edessa, which provides astonishing insights into the use of both languages around the third century. During a long time, writing in Aramaic in Edessa seemed to be linked with the funerary context. That's what you have here. Uh, generally with families uh, represented setting in Parthian style costume. And, uh, and sometimes also in a funerary context with certain mythological themes which could emerge from the same context, uh, such as this with uh, Orpheus, who also has an oriental dress. I mean, it's a person, uh, a figure of Greek mythology, but dress, uh, dressed uh, almost as uh, 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 an oriental people. Discoveries of the last quarter of century have shown that the two cultures were much more intertwined than uh, previously thought. So most of you know very well this inscription, uh, mosa mosaic, mosaic of uh, Mahalahe, uh, which takes us out of the funerary sphere. Well, we, we can suppose it. It shows figures from Greek mythology so the couple Zeus and Hera, with her name here, and uh, here Prometheus, most probably Athena, but her name is not written. And uh, what I thought first uh, to be uh, Cadmus, but which is much more probably Cosmos. Well, so, such as I, I think. Uh, their names are written in a decennium, Greek names written in a decennium, Greek name, but uh, the king, uh, king of uh, gods has a name in Aramaic, Mar Alei, it's a title, uh, Lord of Gods. So it's clearly Zeus with uh, Era, and she has her name in Greek written with Aramaic. Uh, letters, but here he has only his title in Aramaic. And below, the reluctant uh, union of soul and body uh, shows the progression of Platonic ideas. We can also even perhaps uh, think of some influence of uh, a Christian uh, uh, philosophical view, but it's written in Aramaic. On a lighter note, a series of mosaics with Homeric themes, among which two panels show the couples Achilles and Patro Achilles and Patroclus and Priam and Ecuba, uh, probably adorn rich houses. This was not an isolated case. A new Homeric, recently uh, discovered at Tel Shur Tartani in Syria, uh, in Syria, but in the uh, Osroen uh, kingdom. Uh, it's uh, at the periphery of the kingdom of Osroen, shows the same theme with notably Odysseus. In Edessa itself, the mosaic of the Amazons shows that there was no difference between the repertoire written in Greek and that written in uh, Aramaic. And in fact, Greek culture had already been expressed in Syria as, we, as can be seen from Ambrosius Hypomnemata, of which a Syriac version existed on the cover of a diatribe 
against the stupidity of pagan beliefs are quoted many heroes or heroines of the Greek uh, mythology, among which Achilles, Briseis, Polyxens, uh, and so on. So uh, this Greek culture had also uh, already uh, been uh, adapted to uh, Aramaic language. Similarly, in funerary stele, there is no correspondence between language and setting. An inscription in Aramaic can be associated, maybe associated with a rather classical image. Here, uh, the presentation uh, of the man is classic, but the inscription is in Aramaic, as it is here for the woman. Uh, but you can also have an inscription in Greek with two people clearly dressed in a Parthian or Oriental costume. So it's known that very early Greek texts were translated in Edessa. But Tassian Diatessaron was probably translated into Greek from Aramaic. The Bible was translated from Hebrew. So it was probably in Edessa, that the, also it was, was probably in Edessa, that's the story of Arikar, which has the penetrated Jewish culture, was adapted from Syriac, from Greek, uh, Aramaic, Old Aramaic to Syriac, and perhaps reached the Greek world under the name of Isaac. Edessa is thus a case of uh, interaction between two rich and deeply rooted cultures in a mutual exchange. And now to the diffusion of Edessenian Aramaic uh, to the West in Antiochia. I thought uh, I told you that it was mainly about this region that I was, uh, I wanted to speak today. The environment we are speaking about, that of Antioch, the Antiochian, and the region of Chalcis and Hierapolis, in the late antique period, is quite different. We are outside the kingdom of Austrian, so the core of the Syriac language. While it's well documented that Aramaic was spoken here, we are, know of no literary work, uh, works written in Aramaic or authors from this region writing in Aramaic. Aramaic uh, writing is only epigraphic and it's much less abundant than Greek uh, writing. In this context, it appeared probably at the end of the fourth century, but the evidence is difficult to assess. In fact, we, uh, th this region that was really uh, the core of uh, Aramaic in the old time, uh, Aramaic is no more attested uh, in the, at the end of the first uh, millennium before Christ and seems to come new as a written language. And when it reappears, Aram, uh, uh, it's Aramaic in its Edessenian, uh, that is Syriac form, as it appears, uh, uh, perhaps at, so at the end of the fourth century, but surely at the beginning of the fifth century, it's here uh, well attested. Uh, so I will first uh, show uh, um, an example uh, coming from the northeast of Aleppo, the well-known inscription of Nabra, which was found not uh, long before Syrian war. And uh, it was discovered by chance. Uh, the service of antiquity just excavated the mosaic. And uh, uh, afterwards, we had a plan to uh, excavate and try to see in which, which envi environment it was. And uh, excavations were supposed to begin uh, in the uh, April uh, 2011, and of course didn't begin. 
so there is an inscription. It's certainly a sort of uh, a church. I mean, you have west, east here with some uh, degrees which were probably going to the core. That's what we would have lo loved to see. And inscription on the, each side, which are uh, the lines are to be seen from the nerve. So uh, it, it's a testimony of the uh, vertical writing of Syriac. So here are the two parts of the inscription with the date, which was, as always, it's the date that is the more destructed, but we could uh, reconstruct uh, the date as, uh, which could be uh, 406, 407 AD. So the very beginning of uh, uh, fifth century. So it's a testimony here that uh, Syriac uh, Aramaic and Syriac script, uh, the script of Edessa, was already used on the other side of the Euphrates. For the link of uh, languages and Greek uh, versus uh, Syriac, I will first mention uh, an, a bilingual inscription on a mosaic whose provenance is not known since it first appeared on the antiquity market, unfortunately. The authors of the publication date it with its biography to the beginning of the fifth century also, and it's most probably. Uh, and as they, as they think, its origin may be in the region between Dara, Samosat, and Apamea. Like the Nabra inscription, this one is therefore outside Osroen, but probably still quite close to the Euphrates. Even if the, the order of the terms is not quite the same, it nevertheless, it's nevertheless a bilingual inscription. I mean, bilingual in, sense, in the sense that there is the very uh, same uh, information uh, from the two parts of the inscription. Uh, so, Ducrono de Mariposulo, where the Yaun Negro, where Kulun Amno. So, we have a biblical name, an, Aram an Aramaic name. Uh, uh, the same as the Apostle of Mesopotamia, who went to Edessa to convert the Persian Empire. So the context of this inscription doesn't seem very much Hellenized, but the upper inscription is in Greek. And in fact, it's difficult to identify the person when you have a biblical name. Then the inscription of Bamuka. It's a different case uh, with this short bilingual inscription on the wall of a house. We are so in Antiochian here. Yeah. Both versions, so you have here the uh, Syri Syriac and here Greek inscription. Both versions contain the same two anthroponyms born by a father and son the father being in hypocritic form in Syriac, Hana or Uranus. This is strictly speaking bilingual. The two names belong to the biblical repertoire and are therefore not in themselves representative of one of these languages in particular. They do not a priori allow us to determine which is the dominant culture or language the one which was mainly spoken by these two characters. The only pertinent point that can be noted is that the os final, Ioannos, in Greek form, is not usual. We would expect Ioannes. And it could reflect Syriac. If so, this would probably be per perhaps a clue that the final Olaf was already pronounced O in the region, 
at this early period, but it's just a tentative uh, reflection. Similarly, the Syriac hypocoristicon uh, could be the one that was commonly used, and in translating in Greek, they would have restored the full form of the name in, in Greek as an equivalent. It's therefore likely that the Aramaic is the first language of the person who engraved his name. The fact that the two inscriptions are not engraved in the same direction is by no means an argument for the time difference. The majority of ancient inscriptions in Syriac are engraved vertically, whether they are monumental and the work of skilled craftsmen or simple graffiti. The same is true, in fact, of ancient manuscripts, where the lines were written vertically by turning the page. As it's not written, uh, this, uh, well, graffito, I don't know how you can it, uh, on the entrance or on a particular place, it's just on a wall in a corner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it cannot be the name of the owner of the house, which would have, been, would have been written elsewhere. So it's probably a mark left by the architect or contractor who was in charge of the building. In this case, a father working with his son. It's therefore all the more remarkable that it was written in both languages. Here uh, we have a lintel uh, in Bakira. We are uh, still in the Jebel Barisha, so uh, interland of Antioch. In Bakira, it's a very different case in that here we have an official public inscription of the lintel of the Eastern Church of the site. It's the dedication of the church. And this type of combination of two languages is very rare. So you have. Greek here and Syriac over there. The Aramic version says in the year 595, that means of the Antiochian era, so 546 AD, was built this gate, which was made by the deacons Eusebius and Hanina for the salvation of their souls. And we have the same text in Greek, which gives us a date. On the same site, we have another church with an inscription only in Greek. Here it is. So it's in the same place that we have one church with an inscription only in Greek and the other one, which is bilingual. In the sixth century, a very interesting case is that of Zabad, so near Aleppo, uh, because it introduces a third language that is uh, Arabic. Here, uh, with the sketch, you have Syriac here, Greek here, and Arabic here. It, uh, it would be uh, one of the uh, earliest dated attestation, uh, it is the, the earliest dated attestation of Arabic, at least in Syria, 512. If one admits, which I do, uh, I studied this uh, stone, which is in Brussels, uh, and you can go and see it in Brussels, that Arabic is contemporary. The, the translation, and this is the one of uh, Pavel Novakovsky in Greek, in the year 823, on the uh, 24th of the month of Corpaios, this martyr shrine, martyrion of Saint Sergius, was founded under the Periodotus Ioannes. And Aeneas, son of Bucheos, and Sergius III built it together with Simeon, son of Amras, son of Elias, and Leontios, who were the architect, and then Amen. A Christogram, and other names. And uh, Syriac 
Glory to the Father, you see, and with this very peculiar uh, system of writing, of which we have several examples in Syria at the same time. I mean, horizontal lines uh, made of vertical uh, shaped letters. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the year 823, the 24th of the month of Elul, the foundations of this shrine were, were laid. And it was the periodotus Johannes, may his memory be blessed, who set the first stone, and Mara, who carved, carved this inscription, and Anna and Antiochus, the founder. And the Ar Arabic uh, speaks only of Abu Sergios, Antiochus, and Moki Bantimai, and Marie, who constructed. So we have here in Greek and Aramaic a bilingual with sensibly the same text, disposed on the same level with the same importance, and with more or less so the same text, even if secondary people mentions are not the same. We have so uh, here for bilingual, really bilingual. We have other places with. Uh, two languages on the same building, with, but in different contexts. In Calblose, it was a very magnificent uh, church uh, and uh, seems to have been very much, uh, perhaps not, uh, not completely destroyed, but almost, and it's a pity. There was a dedicatory inscription on the portal in Greek, so official script. But uh, two uh, inscriptions uh, in Aramaic, which were not so uh, official. A graffito in Aramaic uh, near, near, on a wall with only uh, the name of people, Anna Yuridia, and also uh, on uh, a keystone of one of the arcs, uh, the name of a deacon who most probably participated to the uh, construction. So here, both languages are not at all the same uh, level and the same use. One is the official dedication, uh, and the two other inscriptions are individuals who let their name when uh, one at, uh, on the construction and one afterwards on the church. We have also uh, sites with two languages on the same site, but in different buildings. One example is Darkita where the Eastern Church has a lintel inscribed in Greek. Here it is, so you have a lintel and uh, a detail. Uh, while another church has the remains of a door jamb with an invocation of uh, in, the, in Syriac, uh, divided in two stones here. Yeah. It's a beautiful inscription, so, so that was official. Uh, but there were also on the same uh, church two graffitis uh, beyond the core in Syriac. Another example is Kimar, with several beautiful Greek inscriptions uh, on lintels. Uh, the rest of the churches are uh, used to park animals. So that's why uh, you have stone to, to close it. Uh, and we will come back to one of these inscriptions later. And on the same site, some uh, little uh, graffito, graffiti in, uh, in Syriac on another, another monument and even of the carved, carved leaves, you see uh, on the capital, we had to 
uh, clean it very, very much takes the inscription. So you see on what uh, one it is. Kima was a site of living of a stillite. You still have this column. Uh, and it's interesting to note that also another site, I didn't give you a, a pictures, but anyway, in Ferderian, both a, a, which uh, has also the remains of a, a church and the remains of the column, both languages are attested as it was in Saint Simeon. So this world of uh, the stillites seems to be very often in sites with the two uh, languages. Interaction between the two languages can also be seen through Greek words transcribed in Syriac. Here, uh, it's a Bashakur. Uh, we have, of course, words of liturgy, of uh, ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, we saw uh, one mentioning the periodot, and it's quite often in Syriac to have this function of periodot mentioned in Greek, but transcribed in Syriac. But here it's in the uh, architecture of society life because we, uh, you see here written on the door, Androna. So it was the entrance of the Androne, which was a sort of uh, well, uh, social uh, building uh, for social meetings uh, here. Another interaction which is very interesting here is in Borges Saba with this inscription, which was in a, on a door jamb. Uh, well, it would must have been on a door jamb. Now it's of course fallen. Uh, and it's uh, near Teleda, so Telade, very, very near. The site is very close to it. And uh, it's written, uh, I trans uh, translate, the sinner Matthew, son of Isaac, uh, from Telada, made and built this convent of the Greeks in the year 1170. Whoever reads, let him pray. It's very curious because this inscription is more, is, uh, was written later than the others, which are mainly from the fifth to seventh century. Uh, this one is ninth century. And uh, it's, uh, it speaks of the convent of the Greeks. Uh, uh, let's see uh, what it is. Uh, anyway, it, and uh, it's uh, the convent of the Greek and it's written in Aramaic. In this region where Greek inscriptions are the vast majority, to have a dedication of a Greek convent in Aramaic is quite singular. Again, names of biblical origin do not give any indication of the membership of the linguistic community, but it's more likely to be an Aramaic speaker. It has sometimes been suggested uh, that this expression refers to Chalcedonian convent, I mean, convent of the Greek. Uh, it seems unlikely because we are in the real immediate vicinity of Tel Aviv. So from this overview, it appears that the natural language of stone writing in these regions west of the Euphrates is Greek. But it is in uh, this language, it is in this language that most of the inscriptions are, and it's generally the ones, the ones that come first in bilingual inscriptions. But it's very interesting to see an Aramaic writing reappear in this region in the five, fifth century, when it had long disappeared. The phenomenon is not neutral. It shows the desire to write in Aramaic the concern of certain craftsmen or donors of religion, religious buildings to write the language they spoke. We can speak of an identity-based approach. 
At the same time, it's not the local Aramaic, probably from the branch of Western Aramaic that is written, but rather the Aramaic uh, of Edessa, Syriac, which differed from that what was spoken. I mean, the, the uh, prefix of in noon in the third person masculine singular, uh, masculine plural determined in a and not in aya. So it's clearly uh, Syriac writing, Syriac, so uh, East Aramaic language in a region which was traditionally from the Western uh, part. The spread of Syriac language and writing eastward was normal in the Christianization of movement from Edessa to Nisibis and Mesopotamia. Christianization of the East came through Edessa and Nisibis. So with Christianization came the uh, Bible, liturgy, and the language and the, uh, and the script. So it took this translation of the Bible and liturgy as they developed in Edessa. But the, the diff diffusion of Edessenian uh, took, place also, took place also to the West, which is more curious. The phenomenon is probably already realized west of the Euphrat in the fourth century, as we have seen in the very beginning of the fifth, it's already there. So what was the purpose of this diffusion of Edessean uh, Aramaic, Syriac, west of the Euphrates? Is it linked to the diffusion uh, of uh, Miaphysitism? Clearly no, no. First, because it predates the existence of structured community for or against Chalcedon, a phenomenon that only appears at the end of the fifth and especially sixth century from the time uh, of Justinian. And it's stabilized really in the different church, in different churches, even later after the Arabo-Islamic conquest. Second, it's in Greek, that we have Trisagion inscribed uh, in the Miaphysit type. Here you have this in uh, Bechand del T. Uh, here uh, it's a detailed part of uh, the precedent. Uh, and here in uh, Kimar, of which we spoke. The inscription as the, the Miaphysite addition, who was crucified for us? O Starotes Demas, I think we uh, see it. Uh, I don't remember anymore, but anyway, it's uh, O Starotes Demas here. Uh, so we have it in Greek. And in fact, the only uh, Miaphysite Trisagions uh, uh, in Greek uh, are known we, we look, when we were looking for them. Uh, it was a, a sort of uh, only Miaphysite Trisagions. We don't have uh, Chalcedonian Trisagions on the inscriptions. So it was a sort of affirmation and public display from the part of the local community of its belonging to one religious party uh, in the dispute. During our researches, we didn't find any Trisagian in Syriac, in these regions. And the only one that had been signaled by Jari, by Jari was definitely not this text. It was very partial, but couldn't be a Trisagian. The theological mentions that we note in Syriac inscriptions are rare, but it's either simple inv invocations of the Trinity. So here uh, it's on the uh, stone here, and you have just Tolithuso. Uh, or like uh, one which is especially interesting is in Kafkila, in the Jabal el Ala, so always in the uh, interland of Antioch. Uh, and in this, in, uh, so it's on a tower, watchtower, don't know, perhaps for a recluse, but it's a situation 
uh, is best explained as a watchtower. And here, yeah, there is an inscription all around this. And on this part, here is a sketch, it's not yet put very cleanly. You have mentioned the Yeldat Alaha and uh, Mariam, Tulto, Kedishta, Butimta Kedishta. The his expression Yaldat Aloho or Alaha is perhaps anti historian, but it's in no way uh, something dis distinctive in the uh, Chalcedonian controversy. So most of this corpus of, in Antiochia dates from a period where there was no equivalent uh, equivalence between language and the Chalcedonian or anti-Chalcedonian community. So what was the purpose of the spreading of Syriac? I think it spread mainly because people spoke Aramaic. The diffusion is linked to the concern of some to be able to write their own language. We know that in the cities, and especially Antioch, of course, uh, the cities were Greek speaking and Aramaic was used in the inter interland. Thus, in the fourth century, we have the testimony of John Chrysostom, uh, who invites the inhabitants of the city of Antioch not to make fun of the peasants who have come from Easter and who don't, do not know Greek. Or again, in the sixth century, Severus of Antioch saying that the peasant in the interland is imprisoned in his own idiom. But so people were speaking Aramaic, but they had no longer, uh, they had no more the habit of writing Aramaic. They didn't have in a, at the time uh, their own Arabic, uh, Aramaic script. Uh, there is no evidence of Western style Aramaic in North Syria for a long time. They therefore went to look for a form of written Aramaic from a neighboring, neighboring region, which in the fourth century already enjoyed the prestige of an established and missionary church, a translation of the Bible, and a liturgy in Aramaic. And finally, a literature that was already quite prestigious, thanks to Bardesan and the Acts of Thomas, but also to Ephraim of Nisibis, who died in 373, and who in the fourth century had composed a work that had remained the absolute reference for Syriac speaking Christians. And so that it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Brigitte Chartonnet, for this uh, very interesting introduction uh, to this word. Um, we open now our Q&A session. I see there are many, many questions already. Um, so I believe uh, Andre Makar uh, first. Uh, yeah, Andre. Oh, no, it was no question for me, sorry. Ah, it was not a question. Okay, uh, so okay. So if I don't see questions, uh, I have a question. So uh, I have two questions actually. One is, um, what can we see in the text? Like, do we have any evidence of Syriac used in uh, Greek uh, texts? So not the epigraphy, but the, the manus, no, the manuscript, the, 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 what we have today of the Greek side of the reception of the of the of some Syriac to reconstruct the how widespread was this diffusion in Greek texts uh, in fact I, I don't know really but I I think we have much more diffusion of Greek and that uh, uh, Professor Brock would be the best, best specialist to speak about that of Greek into Syriac uh, some uh, texts were, uh, were transcribed, but I don't think Syriac penetrated so much Greek, uh, in fact. Okay, yes. 
Okay, thank you for that. Then maybe if uh, Professor Brock want to add uh, something, can can jump in since he's here. I see there is a question from uh, Dina. Um, or Sebastian Brock first maybe wants to jump in. Uh, thank you, Francois. It's a marvelous talk. Um, in fact, I had a, a different question which I hadn't really formulated yet. Uh, the case of the Trisagion with the myophysite ending, it seems to me that at this period, uh, it's really a matter of uh, geographical difference between uh, Constantinople, which uses the, the standard form mm -hmm. in the Greek church, and Syria, which uses the longer form addressing uh, the second mm -hmm. verse of the Trinity. And it only later became uh, a hallmark of uh, two different positions, theological positions. So I think it would, at least I would be very surprised if anyone turned up a, uh, as it were, the Chalcedonian uh, form of the Trisagion at this period. I think it's probably late sixth century mm -hmm. onwards. Uh, it uh, sort of caught on maybe a bit earlier. Yes, what is interesting is to, is to have it on the entrance of churches. I mm. mean, sort of display. No, it's not uh, yes. inside where uh, in a place in the on, on a lintel we would uh, expect a dedication of church or some, and to have it on the lintel, it's a sort of affirmation. Yes, in a sense, but uh, yes, of course, it's uh, locally it's uh, this one. Yes. Yes, well, maybe because it was uh, recently introduced, uh, that everyone thought, well, this is a wonderful new. <laughs> um, we should support it. But then I, I suppose from outside the Syrian area, uh, there, there was opposition to it from uh, an early date. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's not so much uh, Chalcedonian must my emphasize in Syria, mm -hmm. um, but it only later became mm -hmm. that uh, hallmark. Yes. Uh, thank you for this. So I think Dina now has a question. Yeah, so I have kind of a, a big picture question. It's going to take me a little while to explain it. Um, so you basically are suggesting that, and I'm going to focus on the limestone massif because that's really where my, my question is oriented, mm -hmm. um, that in the limestone massif um, that people were speaking Aramaic in the fourth century, and then, you know, the epigraphic habit in Syriac picks up in the fifth and sixth century. Um, and which I totally agree with. Um, and um, David Taylor, um, you know, wrote this article on bilingualism and diglossia, where he also using Greek inscriptions suggested something s similar, right? That you could see Aramaic, and he um, hypothesized that. Um, I, I think I haven't looked at this this chapter in a couple of years that the limestone massif was using more Palestinian Aramaic for spoken Aramaic and then adopt for their writing Syriac, right? Um, now, whether it's Palestinian or a different version of Aramaic, I'm not. It's Western Aramaic, Palestinian. Yeah, it's Western North. Aramaic, right? So, um, what I'm interested in is like, if we have these Aramaic speakers in the limestone massif in the fourth century, we're really confident we have them. Where do they come from? Because Chilenko and all the other archaeologists who talk about the popul you know, the population movement to the limestone massif in the first and second and third century all hypothesize that it comes from Antioch. And even in Andreas de Gorgi's publication in 2016, he again <laughs> says it's coming from Antioch, but then where are we getting these Aramaic speakers? Um, and I've always kind of wondered, like, how do we explain this? Um, and I read this really interesting dissertation in like 2015 or 2016 by Andrea Zerbini, where he hypothesizes something different for um, the population, like the movement, the population movement into the limestone massif in the first and second and third centuries, where he says that the stability of the Roman Empire um, encourages settlement by pastoral populations who are moving east to west because the areas 
are stable and so that we get some settlement in Greek, but we also get a lot of Aramaic speakers who previously had been pastoralist people and then become semi-pastoralist and then eventually become pastoral, um, you know, farmers. Um, so I was, I was curious, like, but I, I don't, I don't know, this is like something I've been thinking around and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Like, where are these fourth century Aramaic speakers coming from if all the archeologists have been saying that population movement into the limestone massif, except for Zerbini is coming from the West rather than the East. Do you understand my question? Yeah, yes, well, I don't think we can suppose there were no one uh, living there uh, before. I mean, you have parts of the massifs that are, uh, have been uh, more populated at this time, but you have also valleys where it's more probable you, you already had people there. And people there, uh, which were there from a long time, would speak Aramaic, I mean, uh, well. So uh, I, I didn't address especially the question of some new people coming, uh, perhaps, but new people coming could also adopt the uh, language that was already spoken. So well, I, I don't think we can say that all everyone would speak uh, Aramaic. It was really bilingual. So people coming mm -hmm. from Antioch, there are, there were, it, it's all written in Greek, I mean. Huh? And so uh, it's the vast majority written in Greek. So there would have been people uh, uh, speaking and reading Greek. But uh, if there were people uh, that were there for a, a long time, they would be, uh, speakers of Aramaic and uh, of a Western Aramaic. I mean, that's what I uh, would uh, think. But uh, there are better specialists of uh, Aramaic dialects <laughs> than me in this uh, uh, assembly. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Um then if anybody wants to join the conversation, yes, of course, uh, can do it anytime. But I see there are other two questions, one from uh, Pavel and then Simon. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so if I can, uh, first of all, thank you for this very instructive uh, description uh, and so many complex cases where we have different uh, combinations of inscriptions used in the same uh, context. Uh, I wanted to ask you actually two questions. Uh, which are broadly connected to this, uh, if we can say anything about the spoken language of these people who, who make these inscriptions in, 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 in Syriac. Uh, that is first this habit of uh, using phonetic Greek forms of names in Syriac texts, which you mentioned, which is very interesting because I know cases where people could use a Syriac form of a name uh, in a Syriac inscription, but they still transcribe a Greek version of the name into Syriac. So what does it mean? Does it mean that they speak in Greek, but they try to write in Syriac or do they appreciate Greek more than Syriac? So they want to keep the Greek form of their name, but then why do they make the inscription in Syriac? And then the second is, do you think that Syriac spreads as a language of epigraphy in any connection with religion or not. I don't mean specifically my physicism, but any kind of uh, Christianity that can be expressed in Syriac, because in some sites, like for example, Rasm al-Hajjal, which is close to Zabat, which you mentioned today, we have, for example, prayers, which are written in Greek, not in Syriac, but uh, commemorative inscriptions which document the, the construction of buildings are written in Syriac. So this, they are detached from religion there. So that's my, these are my questions. Yes, it, it's, it doesn't mean that it was only, uh, for the second question, only uh, writing a religion in, uh, in Syriac. But if they wanted to, what I thought that, if they wanted to write Aramaic because they spoke Aramaic, uh, they would uh, find 
they had to find one form of uh, written Aramaic, and the more prestigious wa wa was Syriac. I mean, that's only even if it was to write Androna, which is not at all uh, a religious uh, uh, term. And for uh, the names, uh, I, I was not, uh, I didn't understand to what you were alluding. I mean, uh, the, uh, the person which was, uh, was the name in both forms, uh, this Hannah and, uh, and his son Mikhail, uh, in fact, we could think of both uh, senses and both uh, directions, either they were Aramaic and tra transcribed their names in, in Greek or, uh, or the other way. The question is that uh, it seems more probable to be spoken of in a hypocristic term form as Hana and to reconstruct the name in Syriac, in Greek as Yo Hanos. But, well, it's just a, a suggestion. I, I can't be sure. Okay, I thank you. I, I meant... Uh, you, yes. you meant that something else? Yeah, I meant monolingual inscriptions, uh, just in Syriac, where you have, for example, the name Yohannes written with uh, Syriac letters instead, instead of, for example, Yohannan or something, or other cases where name could be expressed in Syriac Aramaic form, but yes. it's, uh, it's apparently transcribed from Greek. Yes, it is. Uh, perhaps, uh, in, fa in fact, we don't know really. I mean, we can have a, a sort of a prestige of the Greek form. We can have also mixed families. We can, uh, we can make a lot of, uh, of ma many hypotheses, but it's, it's difficult to, in fact, to know. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, there is a question. I think there is, uh, first in the chat, there is uh, David Taylor who writes, Carolus Brockelman and Guglielmus write. I seem to allude to this uh, phenomenon of the... Um... David, do you want to jump in somehow to expand? No, that's enough. It's just prestige <laughs> names. <laughs> Johannes Baptista, you know, all the rest. Yes. So. I, I, well, the prestige of uh, writing his name in, uh, uh, in, in, in Latin was there, yes, uh, and the Gesenius and so on, Guillermo uh, Gesenius or Wilhelm and so on, yes. Uh, it, it's difficult, uh, it's always difficult to give uh, the idea of uh, belonging to a community from uh, names. I mean, in France, a few years ago, you would have thought that everyone was English speaking because uh, you have those Kevin and so on. And now what is uh, in fashion is uh, to uh, give to kids names like uh, Matteo, Enzo, etc. But we are not Italian for, for that. So it's always difficult, of course. Yes, indeed. Uh, Simon, do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Francoise, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. And um, I have some questions of details that I, I would love to have more details. And uh, a general question that is, I think, connected to the, the discussion. It's uh, who called, if this, if I understand correctly, the language, this Aramaic language, is from Osroena, Ooh. from the time that when Osroena was between Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire. So it keep an Aramaic culture because it was not Hellenized by the Roman Empire, something like that. But who call it Syriac? And because that was really confusing for uh, Abbasid Syriac writers, that they were understanding that Syria is in the west of the Euphrates, but then Syria comes from Edessa and they were very confused. And I am confused about this issue. And we are all confused, I mean, uh, of course. Uh, I didn't know that it was already a, a problem uh, in, uh, in the Abbasid era. Yeah, so... it is. 
<laughs> yeah, for for uh, Jacob of Edessa and for Dionysius, uh, it's a long talk. Uh, and they, they are really confused about this issue. And I, I imagine that the Romans, the Greek, uh, they call it Syriac. And then the Austro-Indian also call it Syriac because it became the language of, the, of Northern Syria in the fourth, five century, maybe. I, I don't know, I guess. But, uh, uh, the problem is uh, which region was uh, Syria? Uh, well, yes, Syria as um, provinces of the um, uh, Roman Empire was what we call now Northern Syria. Yeah. But uh, it, it could have been also, well, frontiers are not, for, for such uh, a name, are a very tricky question. Uh, and in fact, Syria in antiquity as a name comes from Assyria also. So, it's uh, quite difficult. I, I never uh, thought at, at what time, uh, what was the first attestation of speaking of this language as Syriac, in fact. Mm. Ah, I think Professor Brock uh, would know, or Professor Fanon Bay. In fact, uh, the, uh, I never uh, questioned this uh, topic. When do we have the first attestation of this language spoken of as Syriac, as Suryoyo or Syriaya or so on. Yeah, so and my detail, knows... my detail question was about um, uh, the, if you can send me the reference of Tel Adde's inscription of the 12th uh, uh, Hellenistic century. Uh, it it was century. already seen by, uh, I think, uh, perhaps not in Ponyo, but uh, well, I, I will send you the, okay, thank you very much. Uh, the reference. Uh, as to uh, uh, Edesenian be, be, uh, preserving uh, Aramaic as it was uh, an independent kingdom, of course, yes, but there is a question of uh, Palmyra, which is really inside the Roman Empire. And inserted in Roman Empire, it's no, no independent. Uh, and where you have uh, Aramaic also used for official uh, inscriptions, not, not only funerary or dedicatory. And that, uh, for me, is really uh, something exceptional. I mean, and also in Arabia, you have uh, some bilingual inscriptions like Umjimel uh, inscription. Nabatean and Greek. Yes, uh, but in Nabatea, uh, you are, uh, it's also the, the Nabatean. Uh, I mean, when you are in Palmyra, it's really the, uh, uh, just a uh, Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, I meant Arabia, uh, Arab, Roman, Roman Arabia, Arabia yeah, right. in the third century. I mean, Roman Arabia, Bosra, I mean, the region of Bosra. And I, I meant. And um, in Zogma, there is Syriac art inscriptions mm -hmm. I've seen in Gaziantep Museum. Mm -hmm. it's, there is third century or only fifth, five, sixth century? I think they are uh, a bit later than a decennium, but anyway, it's on the Euphrates. Yeah. Okay, thank I you very much. That, I think they are later than uh, all the decennium. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I come back to a, a very general question that's really general from an outsider. So from this evidence that we have uh, from uh, epigraphy, can we in a way establish the layers of population who live this uh, bilingualism? Uh, something like, uh, now you mentioned there, were, there was a priest and there were some, some builders and uh, was, can, can we establish something like this or it's not enough? We don't have enough elements. No, I don't think we, uh, I, I mean, when we have inscriptions, it's people being in, able to, to make it anyway. And you have uh, either some 
official inscriptions, I mean on lentils or so on, well written with a, a splendid estrangela and so on. And you have also a lot of, and in Syria, perhaps uh, the balance is more uh, with graffiti and only personal names. Personal names, uh, I just showed one or two, but there are a lot of them written uh, mainly on churches, on the, either near an entrance or uh, at the back of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the core or uh, so, sort of uh, remembrance, and, uh, Anna Zakaria and, uh, and so on. So it, it means people, who were uh, very, uh, the script is not at all so formal, but it means people who were uh, able to write a name and engrave. Uh, I don't think they would have paid an engraver for that, but don't know after all. So uh, the question is also that of literacy and so on, but. Uh, it's quite difficult to, to go further. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I see now Norm as a question and then uh, Michaela. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great lecture. Thank you uh, very much. I feel uh, very lucky to uh, be able to ask uh, uh, questions now. Um, I would like to. Um, ask you to relate, uh, well, I guess to, um, if, if one can say to Professor Brock's model of, you know, uh, uh, or you also started to, to, do, to you, you did mention the Hellenization of the Syriac language itself, you know, within, within uh, inscriptions or, or texts. Um, uh, but on the other hand, uh, if I understood correctly, or we can we can discuss some sort of process of uh, a resurgence, right? Uh, you were talking about uh, a resurgence of uh, an Aramaic um, Syriac uh, identity at, at around the same time. So I was wondering if you can, um, what do you think of, uh, about that and, and how do the two relate? I think it means that uh, it's not a resurgence of Aramaic. It was spoken in the region. It means that it had been spoken in the region from uh, ancient time and uh, went on. So it, it's more a question of uh, wanting to uh, write it. The question is when you see the volumes of uh, IGLS, inscriptions, inscriptions of uh, Greek and uh, Latin from Syria, uh, you see that most of them are quite late. You have very few. We, you, we think of uh, the conquest of Alexander while well, throwing Greek everywhere, of course. But as for written, uh, there are very few Greek inscriptions from Hellenistic times, a little more for the beginning of the Roman Empire, and the massive part of these Greek inscriptions are late antiquity. So there is a development of the epigraphic habit uh, in, from the uh, third to sixth century. The great majority in Syria of the Greek inscriptions are uh, from the period that is called in Syria Byzantine uh, period, so before uh, Arabic conquest. And in fact, perhaps it's the same for Aramaic, I mean. So, development of the habit of uh, writing epigraphic texts. And some people wanted to write it also in Aramaic in this region. So, so well, I don't know if I answer to you, but. Uh, um, I think so, you know, as much as uh, maybe possibly at this point, but uh, you mean there is um, 
there's a cultural act of there's maybe something implicit about Hellenization that you know there's there's like Greek words being uh, used maybe although there might be an underlying also um, um, choice to to bring back uh, Aramaic so I guess the two can can coexist it, it, uh, in a sense in in front of this habit of writing more and more and more in Greek that people wanted also to to write in, in Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is now Mihaela. Oui, bonsoir à tout le monde. Bonsoir Françoise. Merci bonsoir, beaucoup. Bonsoir Mihaela. Oui, ça me fait un grand plaisir. Uh, um, je vais parler en anglais. Um, so I was particularly, as you might easily guess, uh, interested in the mosaics, the two mosaics with um, um, Greek mythological figures um, mm -hmm. figured as Parthians, as Iranian-like uh, um, characters. Are they, is this a trace of um, Iranian community? Uh, when were the mosaics um, discovered? And I would be interested about publications, but I would like you to develop a bit more around these mosaics. Well, these uh, mosaics uh, are yes. from the, uh, the kingdom of Osroen, and Osroen was a kingdom uh, which was on the frontier between Roman and uh, Parthian Sasanian Empire, so many um, Parthian, and with both influences. So uh, it means that in Syriac also some uh, words uh, from uh, Persian words entered. And, uh, and in fact, we could uh, speak not only of Greek, of Aramaic and Persian, but also uh, Arabic. It was a, a really a mix of culture. So uh, the, the, uh, all the inscriptions were gathered with uh, the mosaics uh, in the book of uh, Drivers and Ile, I, I can send you uh, yeah. the, I, the reference. No, and no. some, um, but uh, some new mosaics uh, were found. Uh, and uh, well, if, I don't know every day, but there are new new discoveries that are made, but which are a testimony of uh, really a, a region which was under multiple influences. Yeah. So it's not uh, a question. Well, uh, people would come from uh, from both sides, and uh, so uh, it was on the road of, uh, of the, on the armies and uh, of uh, exchanges of all sorts. And uh, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thanks uh, again, Professor uh, Briquet Chatonet, and thanks to everybody who participated in the discussion. I believe if nobody else of the many specialists or, or, or scholars who are here want to add something, we can finish uh, with this on mosaics. And we thank again, Professor Briquet Chatonet. Thanks to you. Thanks to you very to much. Everyone who came. <laughs> thanks to everybody who it was, was here. It was a pleasure today. to see you in uh, this mosaic. Um, and I hope to see you all in Paris next July. Definitely to the Symposium Syriacum. Uh, uh, we look forward to this and uh, thanks again. And if someone is not yet registered, it's still time to do, to do it. So. Wonderful. That's great. <laughs> in Paris. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, uh, for our Tetra, uh, we will meet again on February the 3rd and on uh, uh, February the 17th with uh, Matteo Pugliani and uh, Jacopo Pugnici. But this will be talks, our usual talks, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.